Obviously, we're here for the line of duty death training this month. Obviously, there's plenty of these out there. And this one that's a little more recent. <clears throat> and there's some reasons why I kind of picked this one. There's, there's another department that's close to there that years bef a few years before this kind of had something similar happen. And so, and I'll get to that later, but... Um, anyway, Patrick Alterman, um, December 28th of 15, um, fell through the floor, and um, I'll play this as long as this works. a house fire this morning. We've been telling you about this throughout the day here in Good Morning Tri-State, and you heard right here as firefighters confirmed his death just minutes ago. Nine under sides, Jordan Burgess is live at the scene in Hamilton where we got that update just a few minutes ago. Jordan. Just moments ago, the fire chief here in Hamilton confirming to us that one of its firefighters has died. Now the fire was here at this home in the 1300 block of Pater Avenue. We're learning more details at this point as to what exactly happened. Apparently firefighters got this call around 1 a.m. They went inside the home there. They thought at the time that somebody was trapped in there and the firefighter went inside and actually fell from the first floor through the first floor into the basement. Now firefighters here in Hamilton say that uh, he was uh, taken care of right away. They rushed him to Fort Hamilton Hospital, but he died from his injuries. We want to show you some video from earlier as to just how bad this fire was. There was smoke pouring into the street and smoke pouring from the home here. Now, firefighters did end up confirming that nobody was ever found inside this home. And at this point, they're still investigating what may have started this fire and also all the uh, details that led up to that firefighter's injuries. But again, confirming to us that a firefighter has died here in Hamilton from his injuries from falling from the first floor into the basement. We'll bring you more details as we get them here. <coughs> For now, reporting live, Jordan Burgess, nine on your side. <coughs> so, On the 28th, he was a 28-year-old career firefighter, um, died due to thermal, in thermal injuries as well as smoke inhalation, severe pulmonary edema. <coughs> it was 1.13 in the morning on the, <coughs> technically actually, 1.03 in the morning is when the run went out, but 1.13 in the morning was when the fire department got dispatched. See, there was a, um, an alarm going to the, went off, burglar alarm went off in the house first. So they sent law enforcement to the house first. Law enforcement arrived to smoke <coughs> at the residence, and that's how the fire department got started, and that's how this all started. So, first delay of the fire department getting notified was the fact that this thing actually the first alarm to this was at 1.03 in the morning, and the fire department didn't get notified to 1.13. So, <clears throat> so then the dispatcher advised that there was heavy smoke and possibly two elderly people in there. They also stated that there was fire coming from the basement at the back of the house. But the problem is, is the transmissions were done on the dispatch channel and not simulcast on the tactical channel. So there were some issues with dispatch. So like any other run that there's problems, the dominoes are starting to fall. So one after the other, there's, there's these things that are happening that is setting up this to become a failure. So... I guess I'm just trying to point these out as we go along. So the way their dispatch worked is you're dispatched on that channel, and then once you're dispatched, it's like here, we go to an ops channel. But 
obviously here, the dispatcher follows us to the <coughs> tactical channel or ops channel, if you will, but there they don't. They stay on dispatch. <coughs> Initial hose line, when they got there, they stretch it. And, and the way I'm doing this is I'm going to kind of pop through some stuff, some points, and then we'll go through it and we'll actually have the timeline here in a minute. But I'm just kind of hitting some points so that you kind of have a setup of the scene and how this is going. So the uh, first hose line, inch and three quarter, went to the Alpha Bravo corner. Firefighter from Quint 25 entered the living room and fell through into the basement. Basically, literally entered the house and fell in. <clears throat> Here's a picture of the house. That's the door they went into, the Alpha Bravo. Basically made a right-hand turn. Basically, upon entering that room, pretty much immediately fell through the floor into the basement. I mean, it was like, bang, from what everything I read and researched for this. So, so Clint 25 responded. At 114, arrived on the scene 117, and here again, acting officer, he wasn't the full-time officer, um, met by a police officer, advised him that there's possibly two elderly people in the house, and so what does that do? A lot of times that pushes buttons and you have a fill-in officer. So you're pushing buttons, you're starting to like ramp people up. So what happens when we start getting <coughs> the adrenaline flowing and different things, we start, things start tightening down, our vision, our hearing, everything changes. So he does and, and reports that there's smoke showing, obviously, <coughs> and he tells the firefighter to get a thermal imaging camera in the irons and go to the porch on the Alpha side. The acting officer walked along the Bravo side, <coughs> and he proceeded to the Charlie side, back side of the house, <coughs> and then he advised the dispatcher his 360 was smoke, heavy smoke showing from three sides. So that's where the acting officer decided they were going to go in the Alpha Bravo corner, with that inch and three quarter line that he stretched then once he had done his 360. Firefighter from <clears throat> Quint 25 entered foyer, turned right into the room, and the acting officer was behind him, and that's when the firefighter fell through the floor. <clears throat> Obviously, the smoke wasn't totally to the floor, and described it as not being hot. So those kind of conditions, we're not thinking, okay, you know, where is this, where is it, and he's saying that it wasn't hot, so kind of a different view of, of what we would think that it was, potentially, even though he didn't really know where the fire was at that point, but because there was some miscues by dispatch being on the dispatch channel and not on the tactical channel. They had a blip in there. They used cellar a lot over in Ohio area and stuff, but they're, for the NIOSH report, they were calling this a basement, which it pretty much is a full basement. Later we'll get into that. But <clears throat> The acting officer started calling for his firefighter with with no answer and then shortly thereafter engine 24 called a mayday due to the fact that actually the whole foyer area basically was enveloped in fire <clears throat> so command ordered liar or tower 22 and engine 21 to locate the missing firefighter in the basement at 0125 hours Approximately 10 minutes, <clears throat> firefighter was, was located and placed in a Stokes basket removed from the basement and was treated and transported by six paramedics on the scene. He was pronounced dead at 226 at the hospital. 
So, just some upfront things that as we go through that we'll be looking at and talking about. Obviously, this fire was actually an arson fire. It, there was an incomplete size up. He stopped. Once he made it to the, the Charlie side of the house, he stopped partway across the Charlie side. And I'll get into part of that why or what the deal is and later with illustrations and drawings. Wind-driven fire. The wind was sustained at 11 miles an hour. <clears throat> I guess it'll come up down the road when we get into this deeper. Gusting to 30 miles an hour. So, lack of, lack of tactical priorities, incident action plan, <coughs> lack of resource management, lack of command safety, and effective dispatch center operations, as well as lack of written professional development program. Some of the key recommendations that come out of this was their, their incident action plan. The commanders supposed to do a complete size up. They're supposed to uh, analyze the risk um, before deploying people, and that's all part of what lieutenants do, and that's what I do. As battalion chief arriving, I'm evaluating that, and that's that whole point that has to be done. <clears throat> So that's, that's all this here that's documented. Basically, it, it talks about that these are what recommended through the NIOSH report. So we'll start getting into the meat of some of this here. The fire department is a career department, covered 22 <coughs> square miles, 63,000 population, <clears throat> and they have a, a city council for a government type setup. So basically, it's a city type scenario. Um, so they oversee <coughs> the, uh, the fire and the police through that city council. So the fire department consisted of 96 members. Obviously the it, our structure was fire chief, deputy chief, captain, lieutenant, and firefighter paramedic. So frontline there was Four engines, one Quint, one tower, three medics, which they call life squads, one battalion chief vehicle, which was staffed by the deputy chief. One of the engines and the, the tower was basically the crew jumped between the apparatus. <laughs> Depending on what was called for, they jumped. Kind of like we did here at one point. So, again, minimum staffing is an officer and two firefighters. <clears throat> they work at 2448 and a, a Kelly Day over seven shifts. Within the last, well, last, they says several here, but in the last few years prior to this, they had closed one firehouse, laid all fire, five firefighters. Um, so, seven units <clears throat> had been reduced to five, and so the minimum staffing was from 28 to 22. So that was a big stick with the union there. After this all happened, after this firefighter death, the union really started pushing, you know, making a big to-do over shorthanded and the different stuff. So manpower <laughs> is an issue. From everything I read and saw, I didn't really see where it became a factor in this actual fire, but I get what they're saying when, you know, they're backing that stuff off. And where the union's stance on the whole thing was, that was a big deal. So, <clears throat> department has a deputy chief assigned training as well. He has a deputy chief assigned as a fire marshal with one fire inspector underneath them. And there is an actual just a regular firefighter that is a fire investigator with full police powers. Working incidents, dispatcher backfills, just basically like we do, 
um, as far as calling back off-duty personnel and all that, and the shift commander, which is designated Battalion 20, has the discretion to do any backfill as they feel necessary as well. So, the majority of their calls, like anybody else, EMS-wise, is, is EMS versus fire. So they responded to 13,702 incidents, 10,211 incidents were EMS calls. Fire department has a hazmat team as well, 50 member certified technician level. Fire department has been trained swift water ice surface rescue and they're all compliant with NFPA 10,006. Their hiring process is administered by Civil Service Commission. Um, <clears throat> is how their hiring process is. So it's a whole different kind of people overseeing that <clears throat> process. And the requirements must be 18 years old. So over there, obviously, they can be 18 and get on a career department. <clears throat> and they have, obviously, some other stuff like being certified as a paramedic and must be certified as uh, firefighter one and two. <coughs> so, this just goes through and explains volunteer firefighter, the firefighter one and two, which obviously we have firefighter one and two here as well. The, fire, the firefighter on Quint 25, Patrick, was hired in April of 2015, prior to his employment there, he had worked six years part-time with two other departments in Ohio. The acting lieutenant had 25, or Quint 25, had 16 years on the job, but he had a total of 20 years of experience in the fire service itself. He'd worked with other departments prior to coming to Hamilton Fire Department. The acting deputy chief for the battalion, 20, had 13 years on the job, and four as a lieutenant and four as a captain. So he had held other ranks prior to obviously being the battalion. The county, uh, basically the, the dispatch center that the county has is through the sheriff's department. So the dispatch center answers just like ours does. It answers sheriff's department, police departments. Um, so nine law enforcement agencies, 17 fire and EMS departments in the county, and it dispatches calls for animal control, probation officers, and other agencies. It's just like our dispatch center. I mean, they answer phone calls for the town of Brownsburg after hours, the town of Plainfield after hours. So there's a lot of similarities to the dispatch center, but Obviously, earlier I told you that they don't follow onto that tactical channel. They stay on dispatch. So, and that becomes a problem here in a little bit with an issue. Staffing for the, the dispatch center is 43, so 6 to 7 um, per shift. The shifts are 6 to 2, 2 to 10, and 10 to 6. So, to cover the 24-hour period. <clears throat> Every firefighter is assigned a radio. They also are assigned a extra battery with that radio and it's tested every day at the beginning of their shift. So, um, a fact that's listed here is that, that ra his radio was in his pocket and was never turned on during the incident. <clears throat> each radio has an identifier, so each seat just like we do. So A, B, C, D radios, and as well when the emergency button is depressed there, you've got 10 seconds of an open mic, but there it also stays remained open for 60 seconds so that if you can't get to your radio there for a minute, you can talk 
basically hands-free and, and get a message out over your radio if you can get your button pushed. So that's, that's a whole nother. It's all good as long as you get your button pushed. As long as the radio's on. Building construction, house obviously is an older, older home and it's two-story, balloon frame construction and had recently had vinyl exterior, <coughs> vinyl siding put on the exterior. <coughs> and obviously right here it says with a full basement, but the basement was unfinished. Structure was built in 1932, so obviously, so it's the old, heavier timber, full dimension lumber, all that tongue and groove flooring. So this thing's pretty solid. So to think that he fell through that floor as soon as he basically made that turn into there, there's something up with this. So hence the whole arson thing back there in the back originally as I started out with those points. So the second floor, the stairway went up through the dining room, uh, available living space, 1,576 square feet. First floor was approximately 46 feet long and 18 feet wide. So structure, like it said here, been wrapped in the vinyl siding recently. Access to the first floor is front porch and also there was an entrance on the Bravo side. So here's a picture of the house. Obviously pretty close to other houses. There's also a door on the Charlie side. So here is an actual four floor plan of that house. So obviously here's the Alpha Bravo door that they went in, went in to here and immediately fell through. And there's where that where that door is. And if you will see, here is, here is the doors to the basement. So, here in a little bit, when we get into kind of getting into what he did, that acting officer only come to here. He didn't go all the way across the back side of that Charlie side, so what did he miss? He missed, actually, the... And, and I'm getting ahead, but there was one of those doors was open and one of them was closed. So if he would have made on around to, to truly, if he would have got <coughs> truly to the CD corner, he would have seen that door open, he could have seen down the D side of the house and he would have truly got his 360 and he would have seen that that basement door was open and on and on and on. And remember, I said sustained wind of 11 miles an hour and gusting to 30 miles an hour. So, <clears throat> with the door open and then opening doors in the front, again, the whole moving air through a building while we're fighting fire in a, in a um, wind-driven fire is, is an issue to always be <coughs> thinking about trying to control those, those openings is a big deal. Um, here's where it actually said about the tongue and groove on the floors. <clears throat> and the, the floor joists were 2 by 8 and they were 12 inches apart, 12 inches on the center. So the basement was a lot of storage, so obviously there was lawn equipment, shelving, and, you know, when you start stuffing all kinds of stuff in the basement for storage, what does that create? Which, in the very end, we'll discuss part of that is part of the issue, too. And don't really know, but he was entangled in some of the stuff in the basement. So that's part of an issue, too. So um, As you can see earlier, the, the uh, dimensions of the first floor was the same as what this basement is. So the uh, basement was a full basement, full size of the house footprint. And as well as noting that those bilical doors 
Bilco doors were over there on that Charlie Delta corner. So here is a picture or a floor plan with where the fire was. So the fire was directly under basically where he fell through. So by chance he went in, made a right hand turn and went. If he would have went left, you know, it's that whole proverbial, you know, left, right. You know, you never know which one's going to work. But, but here's, here's a point. And to go in and immediately fall through the floor, A, they had a thermal imaging camera, they had irons there, and I get that he, he was also the nozzle guy. But the issue is, you've got to be checking that floor. And I understand that per the statements in here, the officer said that the, the smoke wasn't to the floor. So I'm sure that they could see the floor, but that doesn't mean that floor is solid. So I guess I'm bringing up a point here is you need to be checking that floor no matter what. You need to be paying attention. Does it feel soft? Does the floor feel hot? If you notice that maybe that smoke don't feel hot, but all of a sudden as you're... In a, he didn't have a very long period of time. He pretty much crawled in and fell through. But here's another point that we need to be paying attention to as we're making our way through a house. Sounding those floors. We're on a roof. Sound that roof. Uh, you know, so huge point. But anyway, so <clears throat> this is showing the basement. It's not so of what was where. But from what I read in this other stuff, there was other clutter all through that basement. So, just an FYI, and later it should be in a slide where, and here's those doors. But you can pretty much see that most of the smoke is over on the right hand side. That door is the first door to open. So that door was open, <clears throat> and obviously you can see the smoke stain where that was pushing out of that that door police officers told or over the radio told them actually that there was a door open heavy smoke was coming out of the basement so here's the timeline and the center is called and it's like ours is called Harris County Communication Center HCCC they're called 9COM, is their designation. But <clears throat> anyway, I told you earlier, 103 is, is a burglar alarm came into the house. So the police, uh, <clears throat> as at 105.38, and then they reported heavy smoke at 111.04. And so obviously that delay, plus the fact that who knows how long the fire had been burning before that or <coughs> when it was set. So there was three engines, two medics, Quint, the tower, and the battalion sent to this residence fire. They were sent to a fire that they already know is working or should have known, I, I, and it's it's kind of iffy whether they were ever told that even on the initial dispatch. I never could find anything on that. So I question whether they really knew that, but with some issues with dispatch, I'm not sure that they knew it, that they were getting dispatched on a working fire because the police had said, we got heavy smoke. This basically in the burglar alarm, it's, it's a working fire, so they assumed that it was, from what I read, there was, they assumed that, you know, the burglar alarm tripped, was tripped by the fire. So anyway, so you have this timeline and where the, the police officers at 115 say that, you know, there's heavy smoke coming from the cellar doors. Battalion 20 assigned, Engine 21 is the rapid assistance team. So engine 121 or engine 21 acknowledged that, and then Quint 25 reported the heavy smoke showing three sides of the structure. Engine 26 make you know asked them to make their water supply. 
and he's doing his 360. So then the battalion is trying to confirm about the occupants in the structure. Medic 25 arrived on scene, and battalion 20 requested the safety officer, and that's where earlier in that bullet point that they said that safety officer, safety command needed to be there, they didn't have that happen with the way their dispatch and stuff is set up. So, he had to request it. <clears throat> so then battalion 20 assumed command at 120, engine 24 arrives at 120, and medic 22 arrives on the scene. So then Quint 25 is making entry to the front door at 121, Tire 122 arrives, engine 121 arrives on the scene. So remember, engine 121 was the, the uh, rapid assistance team. He, they were assigned that job. So commander ordered everybody out of the building at 123, and that's basically simultaneously. There's a little timeline there because they supposedly entered at 121, and they called everybody out at 123. So, I see a little gap there, but anyway, simultaneously, according to this, he fell through the floor at that point. So, <clears throat> engine 24 is the one that called the Mayday, because <clears throat> the acting officer didn't call the Mayday. He's yelling for his firefighter, even though he just saw him fall through the floor. He's yelling for the firefighter didn't call the May Day, and in the meantime, that's when it flashed, and basically the acting officer was in, you know, enveloped in the whole fire from where it flashed. And so let's discuss this a minute. So, why did it flash? We got, and so here's my thing. When he fell through the floor, it created oxygen into the environment. Okay, plus the door opened, the door opened on the basement. The door open on the front of the house, so now we have created a true open flow path for that to just do what it wants to do. It's got its air, it's got the movement it needs along with those winds pushing all of this. And, you know, earlier, <clears throat> you know, you saw the smoke pushing out pretty quick out of the house. So, that was into it a little ways, but obviously that air flowing through there is is what created and it had been heating for a while so it was ready to go and it just needed some extra air and that's what happened so thinking about what's happening what's going on and and the factors and the dominoes that have fallen prior to this kind of gets us into that mode of you know where are we going to get this stopped at so as an incident commander, I'm trying to, you know, want to figure out when things start going like this, what can I do to, to stop this whole fiasco to try to get control of things. But anyway, engine 124, the officer calls Mayday, says that he's down. And he also advises command that he has... He has, uh, you know, a firefighter in there. Not only do we have a flash, we got a guy in there, and he repeats it. That they got a guy inside, and it flashed. So command advised nine come to dispatch another engine. So command asked for one additional engine when this happened. Car 211, and I'm not sure, I never could really figure out who Car 211 was. I, I can only assume it's like, whether it's Chief, Deputy Chief, who it is, but ask if there was a May Day. At 124.14, at 125.01, he again asks if there's a May Day, 9 Com Center, no, no May Day. Communications problem. 
Nine times out of ten in all of these, these line of duty deaths, there's a communications issue, okay? <clears throat> so, why we have been doing the things we've been doing in training about staying on the same channel, not switching channels, because that's coming up here in a minute when I get somewhere in these slides. Because what did I tell you in the, on the onset of this thing? Remember what I said about dispatch. They stay on the dispatch channel. If they stay on the dispatch channel and all this is going on on the tactical channel, who's hearing it? So again, another problem. And another problem if, if we, you know, switching radio channels and all that stuff is an issue with, you know, what we've done before in a May Day situation and all that stuff. So as you can see, there's problems with having to switch channels and... <clears throat> So, earlier, slide before, the incident commander asked for an additional engine after the May Day was cold. So, which engine was the rapid assistance team? 21. In 21, making entry to find missing firefighter. Why is engine 24 making entry to look for the missing firefighter if they're not assigned the rapid assistance team? I don't know. These are things that I, I found as I was going through in this report saying, here's something that's different. Engine 21, though, is reporting heavy fire in the basement. Okay? Command ordered like, Tower 22 and Engine 21 to locate. Okay, well, Engine 24 has already marked that they're going looking for him. <clears throat> so you see how the chaos starts really ramping up? When, when things start going to pot, the dominoes just start accelerating and more of them fall. So, this is where assisting or analyzing what we should be doing, where we should be doing it, and who should be doing it is a factor. So, you can see by this stuff is documented in this NIOSH report that I pulled off and put into these slides the, that I don't know that they were freelancing, but they were never told by command. Engine 24 wasn't. They, they just marked that they were doing it. <clears throat> so he did tell Tower 22 and, and Engine 21 to locate the firefighter. Okay, 212 <clears throat> reported or arrived on the scene and reported to command. Medic 24 was dispatched there. Engine 24 reported that he's in the basement. So I'm not really sure. I still haven't. I'm assuming, and again, assuming, that they went in on the first floor looking for him on the first floor, not knowing that he fell through because of how this plays out down the road in the slides and, and as it gets deeper. Engine 24 ends up operating a hand line on the first floor, per, trying to keep the fire down on the first floor. And, and then down here at 129, 24 engine, now I don't know how they're doing this. I don't know if they split. I don't know what they did. And it's another issue I found. Engine 21 is supposed to be with tire 22, removing the firefighter, but here they are operating a two and a half inch line on the Bravo side. And they removed an air conditioner and I'm not sure where out of basement window I can only because in the slides and in the documentation it says they removed an air conditioner to be able to flow, flow better water into the basement so they're actually operating a two and a half inch hose line into the basement to try to extinguish the fire in the basement so <clears throat> then engine 24 says they can hear a pass device going off so then tower 22 reported they were in the basement and they could hear the pass device. So, <clears throat> <coughs> he, 
He went in, or basically the May Day was called at 123. So we're at 130. 133, and it like, I don't know, 45 seconds would be in 10 minutes. So it was 9 minutes and whatever. So anyway, they've, they found him. So um, Medic 25 at 136 advised command that they have the firefighter out and is going to the squad, which that's what they called the ambulance. Command called for a par. They completed a par. So everybody was accounted for at that point. <clears throat> um, an additional mutual aid and fire department was dispatched. Um, Medic 22 responded to the hospital, Firefighter 144. Uh, fire ground operations was changed from offensive to defensive. And then Medic 22 arrived at Hospital 151, and he wasn't pronounced dead until like two something. I can't remember the exact. So, the, uh, one of the police units advised that a nephew said that the, the occupants were in Las Vegas and were not home. Fire was under control at 358. His personal protective equipment at the time, he was wearing all of his hood, <coughs> helmet, boots, gloves, SCBA, everything. It was documented that it was certified in 2002, NFPA 1981 standard. <clears throat> the fire department's fire investigator took his gear and locked it up so that it could be examined and or put through the tests and checked by NIOSH and everybody that's going to check the, his gear. So it was all grabbed and put into evidence and secured. <clears throat> he was on air at the time of the collapse. He was found in the basement. By 22, his face piece, protective hood, gloves, turnout boots had been removed. They, they never did say why they were all off. I don't, I mean, from the way I understand, <clears throat> they found him with them off. <clears throat> his helmet part was off, but the impact cap was still on. Him. So, the turnout gear was cut off by, by the, obviously by the medics, so that they could get to him as far as checking him for injuries and treating him. Sorry, excuse me. According to NIOSH, the the turnout gear was not a contributing factor in this incident because he had it on and was wearing it at the time that he fell through and everything was fine. <coughs> this point's being brought up again. He was carrying a radio, department issued radio. It was in his pocket, but it was not turned on. So they tested the radio and when they tested the radio and turned it on, it was not recognized at the dispatch center, and they couldn't say why that it wasn't recognized. That was an issue found with his radio. But it had never been turned on during the fire. SCVA past device was inspected by NIOSH at headquarters, and at that point, NIOSH didn't do anything else, but I do know the fire department sent that SCBA in for further testing, flow test, all that other stuff. The weather conditions, this, it was 40 degrees, 31, dew point was 31 degrees Fahrenheit, 83% uh, humidity, winds were at 11.5 miles an hour, and, and then gusting to 30, like I said earlier. There had been eight tenths of an inch of rain in the last 24 hours. This is where it's documented that these transmissions that about the heavy smoke 
and the people possibly in the house was transmitted and it was done on the dispatch channel and not simulcast on the tactical channel. This is a note that was in there that most of the firefighters didn't hear that radio traffic at all, obviously. It was on the dispatch channel, everybody. And they also said in some of the extra notes in there that the firefighters had switched to the tactical channel right away so they didn't hear anything on the dispatch channel. This is just reiterating that that officer was met um, this is where there was a note truly in the report where it said that he stopped before making it basically across the back side of the Charlie. Even, you know, he said from the three sides, but he really didn't see all, even completely the three sides. So, could he really tell what's going on? <clears throat> when he didn't go all the way across the Charlie side, he really couldn't say, other than he's got smoke, he really couldn't say what he had going on the whole Charlie side even. So, but because of the way the fire played, the way everything worked, everything as far as an observation, the wind was blowing directly through those Philco doors into the basement. So, again, the flow path. I just put these points back in here again, too. And, and the extra stuff here is the, the color of the smoke. Uh, it's a brownish, grayish tint. Um, And right here is where it was documented too that there was it was about a foot off the floor, so they could see the floor. But it still doesn't mean you shouldn't be sounding that floor. Because why? Because it could be sitting there and literally be ready to crumble or break through. And with a tongue and groove flooring with true two by eight floor joists, that's gonna be pretty solid except for the area that is has been burnt. So you're going to be able to crawl almost right on top of, and that's pretty much what happened here with true dimensional lumber and all that stuff. That's Those are the things you get into with, with older homes. Obviously with newer homes, they're flimsy enough that you're already wondering what's going on when you're crawling in anyway. But so... Reiterating that the officer from Engine 24 is the one that called the May Day, and Tower 22 picked up a backup hand light and knocked the fire down around the acting officer. That was a point that didn't get brought up earlier in the reading, but actually Tower 22 engineer picked up a backup hand line and knocked that fire down around Quint 25's officer. Here's a biggie. Command transmitted a mayday to the dispatcher on the fire ground tactical channel. What have I been telling you all along? What happens when you got to switch channels and do all that junk? Sitting there, you always be, you always got to be thinking. As an officer, as a command person, you've always got to be thinking about worst case scenario, things going bad. What am I going to do? How am I going to handle it? Not only are you worried about what's going on, but you're, uh, I do personally, sit there and think about if something goes south, what, if, what are my contingencies? Where, who is my backup? Who can I pull? What, what can I do to, to make this better? So if you don't sit and think about those things and then something goes south, what do you do? You just keep the mic and start talking because you're needing help and you need things to go, and you need help coming, you need extra apparatus, you need fresh people to come in behind your...
here, the rapid assistance team as they call it. So <clears throat> he dispatch or he hit them on the tactical channel. Because remember, 211 asked if there was a May Day. He heard it on the tactical channel, but the dispatcher didn't. So then what did the dispatcher tell him? No, there's not one because it hasn't been transmitted on the dispatch channel. So here's a big problem. Did it stop things on the fire ground from happening? No. What it did, though, on the backside was <coughs> stop that extra help coming. Because actually, in their stuff, they are supposed to, once dispatch gets told that there's a mayday, they had in place, they're to dispatch an, an additional alarm to this fire once there's a mayday called. But the problem is dispatch never got it. <coughs> so... And that's what it says right here. Um, so it should have got an additional, an additional response. So approximately 125 hours, command order, Tower 22, Engine 21. And this reiterating kind of it goes into a little more depth. Um, Tower 22 forced the rear door. From what I'm gathering, they didn't realize that the doors to the basement was there, so they forced the back door. <clears throat> and so then, at whatever point, they figured out that they, they got in the door the right way. But um, so, and it also states that they were checking with the thermal imager, and it was totally whiting out with it pointed towards the basement. So. They continued, engine 24 continued operating engine three quarter hand line, as well as earlier I told, told, showed you where engine 21 somehow was also operating at two and a half flowing into the basement. So um, that's when engine 24 hit and said that they could hear a pass device. So here is the first floor plan. So this is showing where they went in. They're showing into 24 out here. But so this is, they're just showing where the officer stayed, basically was still out into this entrance just outside the door. And the firefighter went in and fell through, like I said. So this is an illustration of, of kind of where and exactly, and it was right underneath where that fire was shown on that other illustration. Here's actually a picture down in the basement looking up outside the floor <clears throat> so you can see obviously those two by eights are, are gone so and you can see the tongue and groove flooring and I mean it's full dimensional so I mean obviously that's sounding that floor probably I in my thought process would have probably saved him from going in there you would hope and think And this is where documented that the two and a half inch hose line was through a window on the Bravo side. And like I said, engine 21, they're supposed to be the, the, the uh, rapid assistance team. And yet here they are flowing two and a half inch line into the basement. So I'm not really sure how, whether there's something off on the documentation, who was doing that or what. I just, these are some things I found in uh, whole NIOSH report that just didn't quite add up for me. So, um, so Tower 22 obviously said they could hear the pass device. Um, and this is where the documentation was that they, they found him directly underneath the hole. So he didn't go anywhere after he fell through. Tower 22 could see fire in the rafters as they moved towards side alpha. Approximately two feet of water was in the basement. And um, Patrick was found lying on his left side. So it's saying his face piece and all that stuff had been removed. Impact helmet was still on his head, um, but he was entangled. 
So his foot was entangled and they had to uh, free him from chairs and storage items. So obviously that's where I'm saying there was debris and stuff all through that. Now, okay, there was a picture earlier that showed things kind of neat. So was that debris there because <clears throat> this was an arson fire and one of those things, when, when you go in and you see some different things, those are all triggers that can say, this shit ain't adding up. And if it isn't adding up, there's probably <clears throat> something to it. So always be keeping your eyes and ears open. If, if things don't look right, things don't seem right, then, then try to pay attention to those and try to kind of put those away so that you can tell somebody later as far as telling them like here to Levi or Tom or whoever, chief, whoever's coming to investigate that, hey, you know, this doesn't make any sense to me, but this is what I found. So anyway, a lot of debris in the middle. <clears throat> and um, so... And this illustration even shows into 21 with two people on it. So I'm not, I'm not sure, and it only shows Tower 22 with two people coming in. So I still am a little confused, I, and I keep bringing that up. But So this is the illustration of them operating the hand line down in here, trying to suppress some of this fire, engine 24, with engine 26 backing them up, trying to spray water in there to keep that fire at bay obviously where he fell through. So, it's another thing. We gotta keep operating, put the fire out, a lot of the things go away, our problems go away. So we wanna make sure that we don't stop trying to put the fire out. Obviously, they're talking about water being in there, and I mean, if he's laying face down and the water starts rising, and I don't know what kind of shape he was in. I don't know if he was breathing. I don't know if he was in cardiac arrest because it doesn't never say in any of the documentation I can find of what truly happened with him as far as that goes. But obviously he was laying in some water and all that. So those are always concerns. But <clears throat> if we have issues, and I've seen others... And, you know, I mean, there's, there's been others where firefighters have been trapped and the water was an issue. We, we just got to get holes in the, to be able to get that water out of there. Obviously, with the basement, we can't really do anything with that. But we've got to flow water to keep that fire out. So it, it's that whole thing of hopefully that person isn't to the point that they're going to be underwater, but we've still got to fight that fire. Because they're going to burn up or they're going to drown or, you know, so still got to try to mitigate the situation, which obviously we've got active fire, we've got to try to put it out. But the best thing to do is get to the seat of that fire and get it put out, and that way we're not dumping a whole bunch of water in there. But So obviously it just explains that diagram. Tower 22 radioed for... For webbing, and I'm like, well, pretty much everybody around here carries webbing in their their turnout gear, their a rope, or they carry something bailout. Usually, most most people do. Not at all. So anyway, they were calling for webbing to be able to get to be able to get that, and and then here where it says engine 21 was clearing a path to the doors. So. This is saying there was a lot of clutter all over the place that they had to get through to get to him. So engine 21 is clearing a path. So I don't know if that's just how that was or whether that was done that way so that that burned more rapidly because obviously this being an arson fire. Um, so they moved to the basement doors and they got him out. And like I said earlier, this just went into more detail, like I said. And... Um, Arrived at, at 144 and he was pronounced dead at 226. So, so they worked him for about 45 minutes. So the other thing that went on that really wasn't a part of that whole rescue and all that, they went ahead and checked 
because they still needed to do primary on the second floor and check for extension. And with this being a balloon frame construction house, you got to get up there and check. Fire is in the basement, so where's fire going? So we've got to always be on top of the rest of that. And with this happening so quickly into this, everything diverted to the rescue, which through the documentation, this, this occurred in 10 minutes. So it was pretty quick. So engine 212 by command was sent to the second floor to do a check for um, <coughs> people on the second floor, which was found that there was no one there. Um, so then after that point, <coughs> after he was transported, the deputy chief started making arrangements using the training chief and all that to start getting things, the immediate family notified into the hospital, and then start setting up basically a critical incident debriefing type thing. Um, this is a timeline that goes on through um, kind of what they did as far as to get the fire totally knocked down. Uh, approximately 358, the fire was under control. At 0500 hours, they declared the fire out. And this was the placement of the apparatus and where the hydrant was that they were pulling off of. Obviously, this is a dirt alley, so you can't really get apparatus back there. <clears throat> Wind driven fires. Obviously, we've been doing training. Uh, I mean, we've done some. I, you know, that's, that's always got to be a thought process in talking about the whole flow path, <clears throat> controlling the door, all those things. I mean, it, it is important. I, I mean, I've seen it in my early days. I mean, I really didn't know what the hell it was. I mean, I figured it out after it happened, but I mean, it was a high wind type situation and door got opened and it lit up. I mean, boom, it, it lit off. And it was all just because the door was open on the upwind side and it just charged that house with air. So obviously wildland firefighters are taught to deal with wind because most of those places out in California, Colorado, different places, even Wyoming and all those. I mean, there are wide open areas, some of them's hills and valleys and the wind change directions and so they deal with, you know, wind driven fires. We've done it, it's just we never really talked about it and we said that it's a real pain in the behind to fight a fire and real high winds and I'm like, you know, it's almost a loser when you get one in a high wind situation but we can do everything that we should be trying to do, everything possible to control feeding that fire with that wind. And if we take care of and do our due diligence, we can help. Not that it's necessarily going to take care of it, but we sure don't want to make it worse by popping some windows on the wrong side, opening some doors and leaving them open. Or if we find doors open, <clears throat> closing them and doing those kind of our due diligence to, to help make that better. <clears throat> 360, this kind of going into some of the points of things that really should have been done. Uh, him doing a total 360, he would have seen that, that where those basement doors were, he would have seen one of them open. Uh, also, that would have also help him if he had been trained and was um, up on things with as far as flow path and you know high wind driven type fires obviously NIST and UL has done a lot of testing on this so same stuff that you guys have heard Chief Schaefer talk about and all that it's just that this stuff's been going on for a while because this is back in 15. So it's not brand new stuff. It's just we don't necessarily talk about some of it. And so uh, it's there. It's been there. We just need to be paying attention. So hopefully none of this stuff happens. Um, this goes on to... <clears throat> 
talk about the flow path. This is a chart for the last 15 years, basically of wind-driven fires. It just talks about different uh, wind-driven fires over the last 15 years and the firefighter fatality investigation prevention. So that's what that was all about. So obviously the cause of this fire, we've already said it was arson. It was started in the basement. Homeowner has been charged two counts of aggravated arson murder. Another individual has been charged with the same. Contributing factors to this was all stuff that was said earlier when I was using the bullet points earlier. <clears throat> so with our stuff, obviously that's why the extra chiefs come. That's why Chief Schaefer, Chief George, Chief Allen, we get extra chiefs for command safety. Um, and depending on if it turns into a bigger incident, obviously Chief George can take command, I can go to operations, and on and on and on. So, um, anyway, the, the dispatch center, I mean, we've done a lot of work. The operations chiefs in this county have worked pretty hard to make sure that the dispatch center's up to speed. They have increased <coughs> their staffing from what they were in the onset of the dispatch center. Um, we've made, the operations chiefs have gotten some good policies put into place to where stuff's automatic. Recently, the, here in the last year with things, uh, there is a set, basically an additional alarm. If there's a mayday call, there's an additional alarm that happens. So, the incident commander does not have to say start me an additional alarm because of the mayday. So there's a lot of things we put into place that, like here, I mean they had that into place, but because they switched channels and dispatcher wasn't on the tactical channel or the ops channel, they didn't hear it. So, and we also have gotten it to where if it's a working incident, that dispatcher is supposed to stay on that ops channel. They're supposed to be listening so that if the incident commander does miss or the safety officer misses the mayday, then they can say, you know, hit the incident commander. We just heard a mayday from whoever and or if somebody. And, and the good thing about now, too, that we've done, if anybody pushes their orange button, the battalion's portals and the battalion's mobile radio will pop up who's in emergency status. It'll actually say engine 142A, B, ladder 141A, B, whatever. So in the battalion's vehicle, it will actually tell me <coughs> and or the green portables, not this one, but the green portables will tell you too. So, so it's a good thing that we've gotten done here. Along with that accountability system, the other thing that we have that a lot of places I've not seen in some, a lot of these reports and different things is they don't have the SCB accountability system where I can see, and, and whoever's in the buggy can see that somebody's getting lower on air. I can see if they actually activated their pass device or if it activated because of non-movement. So that's a good thing that we have that helps. It helps so that, you know, if, if I see that, I'm going to be, you know, if it doesn't clear very <coughs> quick, I'm going to be hitting. Because <clears throat> it pops up and makes a lot of noise in the buggy. So you can't really miss it. So, so here was the actual, instead of earlier, I, I, it was listed, but... <clears throat> Is carbon monoxide toxicity 12.7%. Thermal second and third degree burns 40-50% of this body surface. So then obviously all NIOSH reports goes through recommendations. Strategy of the incident action plan. Incident commanders should ensure detailed size up. Risk analysis or assessment during the initial fire ground operations including mm -hmm. deployment of resources, Charlie's side. Scene size up, risk management. So 
it, it, it's on the incident commander to, to make sure that everything's good as far as going in. Uh, the action plan matches the conditions encountered. This is just a, obviously the some charts and things they had in their recommendations. Um, one of the other things was a tactical worksheet. Um, this one's about tactics for wind-driven fires, making sure the incident commander and or the, the department has <coughs> uh, implemented standard operating procedures for those. Um, they should obviously look at NIST and UL as, as helping develop and, and put in part of their training and all that too. Recommendation 5, standard operating procedure type operations involving cellar basement fires. And typically when, when they make these recommendations it's because the department doesn't have anything on the books. So all of these recommendations such as policies on this or training on this, and that's why Chief Schaefer is very important, all his documentation on cellar fires, wind-driven fires, all the different stuff he does is documentation showing that, you know, we've, we've done this, and it's why it's important to, to truly understand and participate in that whole thing. Um, communications loop, it's another obviously thing, which is not an issue here, but it was there because of the way they did their stuff. Um, ensure the incident commander uses tactical worksheet. <clears throat> um, ensure accountability system is proper. And like I said, the they didn't have anything in place where they really had accountability. Obviously, if if a lieutenant goes in and is in command, he can't do an action plan on paper. He can't work use a tactical worksheet. He's going on the fly. Me, on the other hand, I'm supposed to be doing that stuff, and I do. I make notes. I mean, when we do PIAs, I've got my notepad where I've written stuff down, made, it, made notes, and if it's a little bit bigger, more involved, that place we don't mention, I always get out an actual action plan paper, and I actually fill that out because that just we that's just that stuff. And then once it gets deeper, then obviously the full packet would has came out but <clears throat> when it gets bigger I do those things because to be able to recall that stuff we don't have we're not videoing any of that stuff we don't so the only way to document it is whatever radio traffic there is and then whatever's written down on paper if there's nothing written down on paper then you can't say that it happened or or how it all played out so um, Command safety, obviously they didn't have that. They had to ask for that. If you remember in that documentation, the incident commander had to ask for safety. Uh, fire department should have a checklist in incident command for a May Day event because it is a stressful situation. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen. There's a lot of things that need to be checked. There's a, a lot of things that need to be put in place. When that kind of stuff happens, hopefully there's some extra chiefs around that can help jump in and either take over the May Day or they can take over the actual incident and be in command so that there is not so much on that one person because it gets kind of crazy. And so we kind of have redundant with as far as accountability from earlier. I mean, we have the pass tags and then we have the system on the SCBAs. So we can see who's active and who's not. So there's kind of a dual thing there. Um, we already do that, but they didn't. Um, obviously, incident safety officer coming on the runs initially. Making sure that <clears throat> officers' training and competencies are where they need to be. Uh, the fire department ensures all members engaged in emergency operations receive annual proficiency training and evaluation on fire ground operations. 
Fire Department review operating procedures and use of operations and thermal imaging cameras. Um, ensure adequate incident scene re rehab because they didn't have any. So it's just the thing showing up rehab kind of a, a <clears throat> rotation. Um, SCBAs um, making sure that they're up to standard and that they've been stat tested, I believe. I believe his his bottle was out. His stat testing was out. I mean, it, it had expired. It needed to be stat tested. Not that it stopped it from working, but... <coughs> Here's the deal. The part of this whole thing with NIOSH is that hopefully when we see people that do things and they die from it, we learn from it, we don't repeat mistakes. We don't repeat the same shit that happens, but unfortunately, what happens? <clears throat> History repeats itself. If you go on looking at NIOSH reports, multiple times over and over and over and over and over people die from the same stuff this department dave and i at one point worked with a guy from this department and they're like 30 minutes they're 30 minutes from hamilton ohio and here's what happened five, six years before Patrick died. Internal investigation into the events that claimed the lives of Captain Robin Brocksterman and Firefighter Brian Shire on April 4th, 2008. And while it cannot be conclusively known as to why Captain Brocksterman and Firefighter Shire proceeded into the area of the building that eventually collapsed, resulting in their death, we have come up and concluded that the most probable explanation is that Engine 102's interior team was successful in advancing an uncharged attack line into the basement area, reaching a point approximately. Seriously. It's like it's on now to show the lights are on. Mm-hmm. 